returning as our guest tonight is one of my oldest and dearest friends. We met over 60 years ago while we were teenagers working our way through the summer of 1961 in Ocean City. We were making uh, miserable wages, as usual, <laughs> down in the ocean, trying to meet girls, learning about life and bonding over our shared tastes in music. Skip had the guitar, and I knew the words to most of the folk songs, but not anywhere near the number that Skip has. And we have harmonized perfectly, and suddenly we were popular along the beach, belting out folk songs to all those who would listen. When we came back home to Towson, we sang together as part of a folk singing group, the Blackwood Singers, and performed in the coffee houses and universities. We were both members of so many other groups as well, with names that I can barely remember. I think we were both part of the Cambridge Trio, and then there was the Hunters, and then many others. We were singing all the time back then, and I still break into song almost every day, especially in the morning when I sing about breakfast. But nothing like back then. While I left music performing behind to concentrate on visual arts, Skip made music his profession. As a multi-instrumentalist, he made a good living as a musician through the 60s and 70s. He's also an accomplished songwriter and storyteller and has published several novels. In the 1980s, he left the music scene for several years only to return a few years ago, prompted by his daughter's interest in music. She introduced him to the world of digital music production and that brought him back to creating new music in the past decade. And we have featured him as a guest numerous times on 21st Century Radio to review his latest music and books. Skip Brooks is a graduate of the University of Mississippi. He now lives in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio, Skip. Roll time. <laughs> It's about time, too. i got to say that. Well. I've lived, lived in Tuscaloosa for 30-some years, and, you know, roll tide. you got to say that's good for business. Well, <laughs> well, uh, I hate to say this, but we are all both getting old. I I'm probably older than you are, and no, that no, means. No. I turned 80 in the, in, on October 2nd. That's not fair. That's no. not, you're older than I am. You should be doing oh, this interview no. instead of me. <laughs> Because <laughs> you, because you know more. I'm the oldest guy in the group. I don't know why that is. <laughs> well, Probably my immaturity as I age. <laughs> well, tonight we're going to focus on your short story writing. I had a great time reading all the chronicles on your website, skipbrooksprojects.com. Let's go through them one at a time, and you tell us. What is behind each story, okay? There yeah. are lots of reminiscences here, if I could say that correctly, in here of your journey over the last 65 years. Did I know you 65 years? Let's start with The Chronicles, a short biography. Tell us about this story, please. Um, the, thing about, um, the thing about The Chronicles was that... that uh, I like I'm on Facebook a lot and when I when I um I put the website together it's skipbrooksprojects.com bada boom um I wanted to use it basically to market my books and and um a couple of CDs that I put together had printed published myself did all that sort of thing um and uh you know in one of the ways to market it was to write some short stories about Things I've, I've, I've experienced over the years, and um, also as I've gotten older, I want my kids to know who I am, and these are good ways to let them know um, after I'm long gone, <clears throat> which may happen sooner than I want. Uh, but anyway, um, that's the the idea behind them. That's why uh, I did them. And um, as I bring this up on my on my computer, um, the the Chronicle story is, is just kind of autobiographical. Um, I started playing in 1957. I think it was the first gig was at like the Lutherville Teen Center. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 
it started with a friend of mine, Andy Savin, who um, was a drummer, and he said they got a new band going. They need a piano player, which was what I did. And um, we formed a band. I think it was called The Saints. As l This is so long ago that the bass player played a stand-up bass. Rock and roll with a stand-up bass. I mean, that's a long time ago. That is a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and one of the guys, strangely enough, was a guy, he played the guitar or the bass. I can't remember. He was named Lee Bonner. And Lee went on to become sort of a, a minor celebrity in Baltimore because he, he went on to play with, I think, a group called the Lafayettes. And they had a couple of hits, a couple of big-time hits. And... Um, so we, you know, we were like 15 years old or 14 years old, whatever it was, and you know, we wanted to get up and 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 do some rock and roll. Um, I had uh, I had studied music for many years, classical music. My my music professor, uh, Professor Crone was his name. He used to come come to my house every week for a half hour, and um, he'd run me through the scales, and we'd work on classical music and everything. And I was pretty quick study. If I played a Chopin uh, tune <laughs> uh, and read it three or four times, I pretty much memorized it. And uh, it was the bane of his existence, the fact that I had some skills and some, some ability, but I didn't like to read. I liked to play my own music. I liked to make things up. And um, so it was kind of the story of my life when I was a kid studying music. I actually went on to to Baltimore, it was called Baltimore Junior College in those days, where I majored oh, yeah. in music. Oh, yeah, BJC, uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, it was over on Liberty Heights Avenue, I believe. And um, um, I, I studied music there, choir and arranging, and, and just a little bit of theory and composition and that sort of thing. And, and uh, it was about that time that uh, I spent a weekend or a week or whatever it was in Ocean City, and I met you in 61. What were you doing down the going down there? Just go go down for the weekend. I was working at the AMP food store on Delaney Valley Road. I'm sure it's not oh, there anymore, God. but it was right across from uh, that shopping center on Delaney mm -hmm. Valley. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, I uh, went down uh, to Ocean City for the weekend, I guess it was, and I, I took an old took my guitar and I went out and sat on the beach trying to pick up girls and get free beer. And you showed up, and uh, we started singing. You had a lot, you know. You're a really enthusiastic person, and um, and I'm not. And uh, and so we started singing and harmonizing. Got back to Baltimore, and 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 uh, you had a friend named Pat Clebino, I think. Yes, Pat Clebino. Yeah. And uh, we formed the Cambridge Trio, and we worked a good bit around um, doing cover tunes, Kingston Trio, the Brothers, mm -hmm. or something like that, and. Um, we went on from there. I remember playing with Pat Clebino as a trio, but didn't we form a quartet soon after with a talented young lady singer? What was her name? I can't remember her name. Her name was Maureen Kelly. Maureen Kelly. And, uh, yeah, I was thinking about her recently. I can't remember quite where I met her, but uh, boy, she was really good. She had one of those kind of bell-like crystal clear Yes. Always on in tune, <laughs> great tone voices that you'll ever run into. She just it was just sounded like an Irish lullaby every time she sang. She was very good. Um, the first and I have, still have the ad somewhere um, that it uh, it was we played our first gig at the Le Flambeau on Charles Street on December twenty first, and I think it was probably sixty two, something like that. Just the two of us, and we. We just kind of flopped our way through two or three sets at the Flambeau. The Flambeau was a, uh, it was up on Charles Street, and it was a row house, uh, and the downstairs had been converted into like a, a little coffee house sort of thing. They were really much more um, into ethnic. I remember I saw Mississippi John Hurt there once. Oh, my. Uh, I, that's, yeah, yeah, we're that, talking a long time ago. Yeah. And um, I think Yank Rachel was with him or something like that. So they were booking more traditional folk acts where the Blue Dog Cellar, the other club in town that I've aligned with and, and um, uh, you to a small degree aligned with, was more into the, the pop, kind of the emerging folk showbiz stuff that was going on with the Kingston Trio and the Lime Lighters and all those. Yeah. Um, and we 
the group we formed out of the Cambridge trio was a group called the Blackwood Singers. And it was you and me and Maureen Kelly. And I um, can't remember the bass player and the guitar player's names, but the guitar player had red hair. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And the bass player, we played a good bit uh, sort of off and on at different venues around Baltimore, too. So we ran into each other a lot. Well, I'll be. But uh, we, we took the Blackwood Singers to WCBM one night to do a, a interview and sort of a get together with, and I can't remember the, the hostess, yeah. the host's name, um, but we were doing our thing and singing and talking and, and folking it up. And uh, we had a break and in the door walked a, a, a guy who introduced himself, George Stevens. He said he owned the Blue Dog Cellar in town and would really like it if we come down and do, do a guest set or a full set some night, which we did. And that was my first introduction to the Blue Dog Cellar. Um, I think that group, Blackwood Singers, broke up shortly thereafter. I think you wanted to stay focus more in school. Well, I and did. I'm not sure what the other two guys wanted to do, but Kelly and I forged ahead with the little duo that we had. Yeah, I was uh, very uh, involved, as we talked about before, with trying to keep the, uh, the uh, people that are uh, into sports from beating me up all the time. Uh, that yeah, you were it. running for your life a lot, so yes, and yeah. it didn't really, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really mesh well with what we were doing. But for you know, one thing led to another, and all of a sudden, um, I aligned myself with the Blue Dog, and um, Kelly and I started building a duo, and we had some some pretty good local success. The two of us. She didn't play an instrument, but boy, she sure could sing, and we sang a lot of sort of middle of the road, half ethnic, half pop folk songs and played around. We played, you know, like high school hoop nannies and played the, uh, the the world championship muskrat skinning contest in Cambridge in 62 or 63, I think it was. We followed the muskrat skinning, so the stage was really slippery and really messy, but they paid us good, so. The muskrats. <laughs> so, we, so, you know, we were good for that. Oh. Uh, but we just kind of forged ahead with that. I don't know of any other really folk music establishments or coffee houses that existed in that time in the 60s other than the Flambeau and I, the Blue Dog Cellar. I uh, but the Blue Dog Cellar was bringing acts in from from uh, New York. I saw where Lucy Simon, uh, Carly Simon's sister died recently and, and we booked the Simon sisters in there. They came in for a week. Uh, Carly was great, great ears, great singer, great guitar player. Um, so you got to to meet a lot of, of people on the road. And uh, so it was really, really worked out well for me. Well, I, it worked out well for me because I, when I needed to stop, I could stop and yeah. <laughs> without hurting anybody from that standpoint, yeah. you know, because that's what usually happens when you got a group together and you start uh, singing and being uh, more successful than, than uh, you lose a lot of your freedom. Sure. Well, it's like a marriage to some degree, a bad marriage in some cases. Um, you really get locked in, and, and I've, I've been down, I've been in that scene too in later years, and, and uh, it's not pretty, but, you know, I mean, we walk, this, we walk this earth alone, you know, we are, it's my only child and it's coming back, you know, but, but you know, we have to do what's best for us. Well, and, um, yeah, you know, my only goal was to get out of Baltimore and get to New York and and take a shot you know that's what i wanted to do and you did it yeah i did yeah well i took the shot i'm not sure the shot was was a was a good one but uh, was it double shot uh, of your baby's love that's not quite that but um <laughs> you know the 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 business is really an interesting business show business at least it was then and we're talking 50 years ago 60 years ago when it was totally different from what it is now and, um, you know, if it was, if, if, if this was what it was 60 years ago, I'd probably be selling shoes in a mall somewhere. Well, that's what I do every now and then, you know, because yeah, yeah. you know, I like shoes an awful lot. It's that well, foot thing, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as a musician and a writer, I learned more about you uh, and myself, mainly because I had no idea that um, I was going to be playing around like that down on Ocean City. Um, and I'm so glad that uh, it happened when it did. We have to take a break now. Our guest is Skip Brooks, and we're talking about his short stories and long artistic career as a musician and writer. Learn more about him at www.skipbrooks.com. 
brooksprojects.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our guest is my old and very dear friend, Skip Brooks, and you can listen to some of his music and read his writings at skipbrooksprojects.com. Let's return now to your short stories on the web. Thinking about John, you described as a true reminiscence of a chance meeting with a great jazz singer at the club in Niagara, New York. Tell us more. You know, um, show business, uh, Bob, show business is a really, it, it's, it's an odd business because you have these, when, when you're starting a project, you, you kind of get an image and a sound in your head of what you want your sound to be like. And for all of us in a group that I work in that came out of Baltimore to New York, a group called David, Della Rosa, and Brooks. I was Brooks. Um, we put it, uh, it, it, we did a lot of rehearsing in, in Baltimore before we moved there in January of 65. And one of the, um, our, our sort of role models in, in trio singing was a jazz group called Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross. They were really strong in the late 50s and early 60s, did a lot of what we call scat singing, and, and um, it was just an awesome group. If you, if you like music, you know, you got to love Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross. But anyway, uh, the group I was with, David, Delarosa, and Brooks, and this was probably 66 or 67, we played a concert at Niagara, New York, Niagara University in Niagara, New York. And um, after the gig, uh, we went downtown into Niagara looking for a place to grab something to eat before we drove back to the city. And we walked past a little one of those A-frame signs on the street that said, One Night Only, the John Hendricks Trio. Oh. So in we went. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it was like, and there wasn't a lot of people there. It was just, you know, a few folks, and John was singing, and he had a, a jazz trio, piano, bass, and drums behind him. And he was doing his thing, and uh, just a delightful find just to chance upon something like that in a place like Niagara, New York, of all places. So we sat down, we grabbed some food and had a couple of beers. And, and uh, during the, the, the band's break, John came down and sat at the table with us. You know, we introduced ourselves and everything and told him that he was one of our true idols. We believed he was a genius. If he didn't know it, we knew it. And um, just as a, as a mentor and as a singer, you know, he was the best there was to us. And he said, well... You know, he's a very erudite, very classy kind of guy. And he leaned back, you know, and he rolled his head back and forth. And he said, uh, he said well, you know, come on up on stage and we'll do something. You know, so we were floored, absolutely. And so when he started his next set, called us up on stage, and we did a, a tune with John Hendrick. So we picked one of mm -hmm. the Han Lambert Hendricks and Ross songs, a simple one called Sermonette. I heard me a sermonette. Have you heard it yet? That's what it's yeah. And um, we did our version, and he just kind of worked with us and grooved around it, and, and it was just, it was a night that I will, well, it's, you know, 60 some, 50, 60 some years ago, and I still remember it clear as day, and um, uh, just was a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, John was a, was a, a lot of people don't know who John Hendricks was. If anybody ever saw the movie White Men Can't Jump, oh, uh, yes, there yeah. was this sort of minstrelly, no, not really minstrelly. That's a, a tacky word to use in this case. Um, it was a, a, a kind of a wandering trio that wandered through different scenes in the movie. And they would sing, it was three older black men, and they would sing some things and kind of lead into a, into a scene. Well, John was one of those. John was a guy wearing the little flat cap, the little cabby cap. And uh, if you ever watch White Men Can't Jump, watch for John in there. But uh, he lived to be almost 100 years old. He did for years a one-man show uh, about the birth of the blues, and it was just brilliant. He was just, just a great guy. But he, was a, a, he would take, as a ar vocal arranger, he would take a improvisation that, say, Miles Davis does on the song Summertime, Summertime, and he would put lyrics to it and then arrange it for three voices. And... and arrange it in a jazz style, but not one, three, five. If any musicians are listening, you know what I'm talking about. The one, one, three, five, it was a lot of real interesting changes and real classic stuff. So that was my story about John Hendricks. You know, I've got 
you run into all these kind of odd people in, in, the music, in the music business when you're on the road. They don't really think much about it. You know, like I played with B.B. King's band one night in Oxford, Mississippi, and, you know, and mm -hmm. opened for Flip Wilson and, and opened for Richard Pryor at Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio. You know, I mean, you just run across these people in, in your travels. And, but John was the top. If they ever say, name your top five people you ever opened for or played with or, or hung out with, John Hendricks would be right up there. He's a brilliant man, just brilliant. Well, thanks for educating me about this individual because I had no idea who he was. He was lovely. He was very hip, very together, just very, just a really classy guy. I mean, you had to just really love him. He was just a beautiful guy. When I look back over my musical life, there's maybe five or six moments I'll carry to my grave. I worked Michigan State once to about 13,000 people. That was big. Uh, and, of course, opening for Richard Pryor at Marietta College in Ohio was a really big one. And even playing a gig in Sweden with an all-girl rock band from Prague, you know, those are big moments. But that night in Niagara, New York, that was the biggest one of all. That was something. Well, Fervovic is a reminiscence of a gig in Fervovic, Sweden. When you were playing piano for Josh White Jr., what happened? Um, Josh White Jr. was a, uh, I worked with, with Josh, or as I called him, Donnie. Uh, Josh and I worked for um, about a year together, and he was pretty much a, a stand-up guitar player, folk singer. Uh, we were managed by the same company, and he wanted to, to kind of, try his hand at playing in clubs and lounges and so they and my group had broken up and I was just kind of bumming around the city and uh, so I um, uh, they tabbed me to be his piano player and to arrange the basic charts the musical charts for the musicians we'd pick up in every city we played in I would go in a day or two early and I'd rehearse the musicians he'd come in we'd rehearse and then we'd do the gig um, so he was kind of just a, a, I don't know how to describe Josh. He's still alive, still doing it, and still on the road, but he just did a lot of pop stuff. His father had been a legendary, uh, Josh White was a legendary blues singer uh, in um, New York City in the 40s in the, the, the Cafe Society Club thing. Um, and he, I met Josh Sr. He was just a great performer and a great player and just really a nice guy. I met him in the early 60s when I got into music in the business. A couple of acts I worked with, we opened for Josh. So that's how the relationship started. And then I, I met his son. So we set about playing cocktail lounges and clubs and things around the country. And um, his father was very big and went every year to tour Sweden. Uh, the Swedes loved uh, blues music, American blues music, and they come out in droves to see him. And the other thing about Sweden in the summer is it's sunny all the time. I mean, the, the, it, it's very far north, and so there's not a lot of darkness. So all the Swedes get out and they go to amusement parks, and I mean, they really get outdoors when the when the heat is there, when the summer is there. So we went in June. I think it was probably 1970, and we were there for three or four weeks. We played an outdoor open theater called Grunelund in Stockholm for a week. Flew across the island to Gothenburg, the second city, and played a place called Liseberg, which was an outdoor amphitheater. And um, our third gig was north of St Stockholm, about 200 kilometers north, in a city called Yevla. And it's spelled G-A-V-L-E, and how they get Yevla out of that, yeah. I don't know. But close to, the, to Yevla, Sweden, is a, a amusement park and a zoo. Uh, called Fudevik Parken, and so we we went up to play our gig in Fudevik, and um, flew across to Sweden and did all that, and wound up in Fudevik in the third week. And we did a set at six o'clock, and we did another set about eight o'clock. And uh, what really struck me about it was it was so far north, the sun never really went down. It was kind of bright along the horizon, about a two-inch swath. And then around one in the morning, the sun started coming up again. And at two, I was on the beach in the Gulf of, at the Gulf of Bothnia at 2 a.m. in the morning, and the sun was up. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, um, we did the gig at, at, in Fudovic at the park, and their opening act was an all-girl rock band from Prague, Czechoslovakia. And um, uh, we were like, yeah, right, I'm sure they're really something. And the curtain opened, and here they were, all seven of them. They were all 
decked out in jumpsuits and and uh, all girl rock and roll band, and they did some blood, sweat, and tears tunes and a couple of Chicago tunes. They had a horn section, and they were really solid. They were really really good. The only problem was they didn't speak English, and we didn't speak Czech, because um, <laughs> I wanted to try to get them to defect and put an act together with Josh. And and the rock and roll, all girl rock and roll band. We could kill Vegas with something like that, you know. They call it Bridge Over Troubled Waters or Josh White Jr. and the Iron Curtain, you know. It was <laughs> it was one of those things. But one, I think the guitar player had had worked on a commune in Cuba one summer when she was younger, and she knew a little Spanish. And I lived in New York, so I knew a little Spanish too. And uh, so we kind of we kind of um, uh, conversed in a really basic level. I don't think they were real interested in in defecting to the United States, but I thought it was a great idea. But anyway, um, that was our that was our big thing in uh, in Hudovic. We worked with an all girl rock and I mean, who works with a, an opening act that's an all girl rock and roll band from Prague? I mean, that's you know that's really out there. That's mm-hmm. like an alternate reality, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's great, and I I, I will. Um, I will uh, recommend to all of your listeners that if you ever want to go to Europe, throw Sweden in there, throw Stockholm, throw throw uh, uh, Copenhagen and Denmark. You know they're just beautiful, beautiful places. Sweden is a lovely, lovely city. You know, Stockholm is a lovely city built on islands, and uh, we used to take a boat to work. We walked down to the to Nybergatten and um, to Nybroplan, and we'd get on a ferry boat and we'd go out to Grönland and we'd do our sets and then we'd come back and. It was just a, just a very very interesting place, but that's Feudovic. That's my Feudovic story. Yeah, <laughs> I worked with Josh for maybe a year or so, and um, he decided to go back to um, playing single stuff with his guitar, and I I then went south. Um, but uh, those were very interesting times. Well, yeah, it sounds it, it sounds it very yeah. much. You know, I don't think about them that way. It's just my life. You know, it's like, yeah, well, I did this and I did that. But, you know, when I write them down and I look at them, I think it's, you know, people don't do that. You know, it's very unique and it's, it was a great, those were great experiences, you know. Yeah, it sounds. I was a kid who grew up in Baltimore and I'd never been, you know, the farthest south I'd ever been was D.C. and the farthest north was New York, you know, until I was 20, 21 years old. You know, and then all of a sudden the world exploded and, and um, I just, went everywhere for seven, eight years, literally everywhere in this country and a bunch of other places too, you know, all because I had a good ear and I could play music. Time for another break. Skip Brooks is our guest on 21st Century Radio, and I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and you can find links to all our guests, books, and websites at 21stCenturyRadio.com. We also post weekly to Facebook and YouTube. More after these messages. And we're back. This is 21st Century Radio, and we're talking to Skip Brooks about his short stories, novels, and musical projects. This is a multi-talented artist who has explored many different mediums, and I'm proud to call him my good friend. Check out his website, www.skipbrooksprojects.com. Dot com. Almost Oliver is an excerpt from a book you're working on, Beck's Island, about a washed-out musician in the 1980s. Is it somewhat autobiographical? Yeah, it is. Um, and it, it, but, but it actually happened. It, it just shows you how weird the business can be sometimes. Um, there was a... Uh, after I stopped working with Joshua Jr., I, I played some music with um, Big Three Music, which was then something Feist and Miller, and and um, they uh, they published a few tunes through Leo Feist, which who was an ASCAP um, uh, publisher, and uh, I had a contact there at at uh, Big Three Music, and he called me one day. I think his name was Eddie. and he said, "Do you know who Bob Crew is?" And I said, "Yeah, I think I remember. He's that kind of." Uh, Orlan V-neck sweater, Gucci loafer, bleach blonde, <laughs> Southern California guy, right? And he yeah. does sort of, you know, popish stuff. He said, "Yeah," and he, I remember he said, "Yeah," but he's really smart and he's got a lot of irons in the fire. And he said, "He wants to hear your stuff." So, 
So I've set you up a meeting, blah, 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 blah. And he said, go over there and put new guitar strings on and play him some tunes and see what he thinks. He's working on a project now. He's going to do some, some of the songs from Hair and try to uh, make some good recordings and airplay and get some airplay. And I said, great. So I hauled the guitar over and um, uh, met with Bob Crew. And Bob was a very sharp, very hip guy, very nice, um, very soft-spoken. And um, uh, he was uh, very complimentary. And uh, we chit-chatted for a while. And he said, why don't you do a few of your tunes? And I said, yeah, well, I'll be glad to. And I played a couple of songs that I had recently written and um, uh, uh, with guitar. And um, he liked it. His secretary came in, sat down. He asked her, do you like it? Yeah, I like this. It might work out. And, um, and so um, uh, on we went. And um, he was kind of... I don't, I don't know what his thing was, but I remember before I left, he said, oh, before you leave, he said something to the effect of, when were you born and where? So I said, uh, I was born October 2nd, 1942 in Baltimore. And he said, okay, he wrote it down and he said, uh, what time of day? And I didn't know what time of day. I knew it was 1014, but I didn't know whether it was 1014 AM or PM. So I just took a guess and I said, I think it was 10:14 a.m., October 2nd, 1942, in Baltimore. He said, "Great." He said, "I know it sounds weird, but I like to just kind of do a little charting, a little astrological charting yeah. before I approve something." I said, "Hey, you know, okay." Yeah. So I left and went about my business and went back. And and uh, about a week later, I got a call from the guy at Big Three Music, Eddie, and he said, uh, "He said, well, you know, he said it's too bad you weren't born at night at 10:14 at night." He said because. Uh, <laughs> Bob picked another guy whose astrological, astrological chart worked out a little better than yours, and they're in the studio now recording um, tunes from Hair. And um, it happened to be that that those tunes from Hair with the guy who he was using, and he nicknamed him Oliver, um, they became really big hits and made Oliver a lot of money and made Bob Crew a lot of money too. And um, you know, just uh, just as a as a really, I mean, it's a bad story for me, but as an even worse ending. The next time I went back to Baltimore and I saw my mother, I asked her when what time of day I was born. She said you were born at ten fourteen p.m. And I thought, Christ, I, I was almost Oliver. <laughs> right there. Serves your. But right. I can't remember the name of the guy who he, who he picked. He was a he was a guy who who was around. We sort of knew each other. I think he passed couple of years ago but um it wasn't a flash in the pan i think he did they did two or three songs and and uh they got a lot of airplay and um and uh, they're good on the charts but um i never saw any of that money so <laughs> so it was a waste of time for me but just 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 a, a i mean that's the way the business was you know just a weird guess and you guess wrong and and um there you go he's then off in a trouble direction yeah well now you know Exactly when you were born, right? Now I know exactly when I was born. Yeah, when I um, when I started uh, uh, when I started doing my um, uh, doing some ancestry search, um, I knew who I was when I oh, really? <laughs> when I saw me when I saw me there because I was born ten fourteen p.m. October second, nineteen forty two. Yeah, that's really odd. Anyway, that's almost Oliver. I almost was. Isn't that something, really? Um, yeah, that actually got me out of New York, though. At that at that point, I decided I'd, I it was time to go, and I I joined a group that worked out of Gatlinburg, and uh, that's how I got south. Did you uh, ever enjoy working in New York? You know, in those days, nowadays you can you can go downstairs and and, and use Pro Tools or uh, some Steinberg Cubase or any number of software programs, and you can produce masters. I mean, you can produce you know, really high quality. You got the equipment. You, I mean, you don't need to go to a studio. You got, can do it at your house. I mean, I never booked a studio here to do my my music. I just do it myself. I got Pro Tools. Um, but in those days, in the early and middle '60s, if you wanted to be in the music business, you either went to L.A., Nashville, or New York. And growing up in Baltimore, you know, I just went to New York because it was close, and it was a kind of of um, overall sensibility that I was into at the time that 
kind of folk thing. Dylan was starting to rise and Peter Paul and Mary and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that was what I heard. And so I went to New York. But nowadays, I mean, the business is so different now. I mean, you know, it's not about the artist anymore. It's about the visuals and it's about the, it's about the beat. And it's about the, you know, mm -hmm. the hook. And, yeah. and um, it's not my kind of business anymore. I like songs. I like writing songs. I like arranging songs and singing songs and, and well, doing all that sort of thing. It uh, keeps me relatively sane. <laughs> How have you been surviving through the pandemic and all the changes? Um, I survived pretty well. I was retired when the pandemic hit and people weren't hiring, you know, 78 year old guys to do anything except maybe be a greeter at Walmart. And I'd rather not do that. <laughs> uh, it's a noble, it's a noble occupation. I'm sure I don't mean to diss anybody who's greeting at Walmart, but that's not my cup of tea. So I just kind of hibernate. I finished my two books, which by the way, I'm sending you all three of them again. Um, so you have all, all of, all of them together. 99 years in the Great Smokies. Thank you. And, um, and uh, uh, so I just kind of hunkered down. And I found out that I liked it. You know, I like to do yard work. I like to keep the house up. I like to cook. I like to make bread. Mm -hmm. um, I like to write and I like to play music. And I got a studio downstairs. I got a little nice screen porch that I can take my computer out and I can write books. So I was rolling along just great. Got my vaccinations and my first uh, booster and my second booster and last June my daughter Taylor and I my oldest daughter who has been on your show by the way uh, on uh, when we did one um, or it must be 10 years ago and she was uh, she was on that one but oh, anyway yes. um, we flew out to Reno to visit my son Zach and uh, while we were there we went down to Yosemite and over into into the hippie areas in Northern California and all that. And we came back a week later, and we both had COVID. We had caught COVID there. Uh, but it was a very mild case. I didn't even know I had it. And uh, my wife, you know, said, let's test. And so we tested, and we both had it. Ooh. Uh, I really wasn't, it really was not not a big thing to me. And I, as soon as I, I untested, or I tested uh, negative, you know, I was able to go out again. Um, but three months later, uh, around my birthday this year, October, um, I got shingles, and I've had both of the shingle shots. Whoa, what and is I that? I went online, and I said, how is that possible? And it said, sometimes people who have COVID, it, it weakens your immune system, and that old zoster virus that's been floating around in your system for 75 years rolls itself out and gives you some shingles. So I had a mild case of shingles, too. But that's my COVID story, you know, my two or three years' worth of of, of COVID that had, I guess it's changed all of our lives, but I know it has changed mine. Yeah, uh, certainly. Has. I live a smaller life, a quieter life, in most ways, a happier life, um, being retired and, and being an old guy. I enjoy it. I'm having a great time. Well, last time we talked, you were talking about changing demographics in America. Yeah, that's what's going on now politically in America. It's all about the, the, this huge demographic shift that um, I'm not real politically correct, but you know, us white folks are going to be minorities just like everybody else. Or there's going to be no majority race in the or color in the United States in about 20 years. And um, I think the power structure in this country uh, is revolting against that. There's a lot of uh, that's where the the anger and the violence and of course, we've had some political demagogues come forth too that have, that have helped it. But it, to me, it's all about it's all about the demographics. William Fry wrote the book that it really impressed me. And I'm not a real, you know, I don't get into graphs and charts and all that sort of thing. It looks like gobbledygook to me. But um, uh, he really nailed it. And he said, you know, 2020 is going to be a rough time. 2024 might even be a little rougher, and then it's going to calm down as as the demographic shift changes and as more brown folks and Latino folks and women and, you know, all kinds of, of, of Americans other than, you know, white guys are going to uh, assume power in the United States. And for me that, you know, it's, it's you, know, you can rant and rail about one group or another group, but it's all about demographics, you know, and mm -hmm. fear and anger and loss of power. Oh yeah. Ta -da! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I'm, I'm avoiding uh, talking about any particular politician, uh, especially since uh, someone has uh, decided that he's still going to run again, <laughs> which is... Uh, uh, let me just say, he's not my kind of guy. He's, he's a supreme narcissist to me. I was married, my first wife, my late first wife was a had narcissistic personality disorder, and it's, you know, I, I can kind of read him like a book. I know, I know where his head's at after 11 years with her. Um, and um, I just, I, he's not my guy. I mean, I'm a Democrat. I've always been a Democrat. Come from a blue collar family, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm so glad that we finally had a chance to get you back in here. Uh, my life has been insane. I know that's not nice for me to say it, but there are just so ma too many things that I'm involved in that I promised other people that I would help. And over time, I'm helping so many other people, I'm no longer getting my work done. And You're so, no longer helping yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, now I realize that now. Uh, but I've been very fortunate in, in the fact that the, the, the quality of my life and being an artist and accomplishing what I wanted to, but after a while, when you take a look at uh, where our country is now, my desire is for us to somehow come together as one. I know how corny that sounds, but I think without that, we're never going to be able to be the kind of people we should have been and have been in the past. I've always found oneness to be kind of elusive. I, I think we've always had stress. We have some in this country politically and, and uh, I mean, there's just so many people with so many different cultures coming from different parts of the world. And it's always kind of been that way, I think. And, and for me, the real, the real thing about getting older to me has been that I'm, it's, and I, I truly believe this as you get older, you need to just kind of pay attention to all the things that you never were able to do because of all of what you're talking about. And, you know, and kind of pull it in and, and, and kind of the oneness that I, I seek is a oneness within myself. That's what I meant. And oddly enough, at 80, I feel like I'm sort of getting there. I'm sort of getting there, you know? Well, we are out of time for this hour, but we'll be back after the news with our guest, Skip Brooks, my old friend and singing buddy. Skip is also a published novelist and poet, and you can read his short stories that we are discussing at his website, www.skipbrooksprojects.com. We'll be right back in a few minutes. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer, research assistant, and engineer tonight is Laura Cortner. Returning as our guest tonight is one of my oldest and dearest friends, Skip Brooks. We are talking about his long and varied career as a musician and writer and our 60-plus year friendship. A Night at the Casbar is about a Vegas gig, and an evening at the legendary lounge at the Sahara on the Strip. Sounds very, very intriguing to me. Tell us some more. Uh, well, actually, it was it was a more about um, the creation of the electric bass. I saw I was playing around on the internet one day, and I just uh, I saw a, um, a picture of an Ampeg bass, and it was the body of it was lucite, that clear kind of plasticky thing. Clear, mm -hmm. you see all the way through it. Yeah. And I remembered I'd seen a guitar like that once when uh, one time when, when I played uh, Vegas with Josh White Jr., we played the Mint Hotel downtown. Um, and when you play Vegas, I mean, you could play at eight in the morning for three hours, you could play four in the afternoon, you could play 10 at night. We had a gig, one of our gigs there, one of our times was like one in the morning till 3.30 or something, a.m. And so after that, we went out to the Cas Bar that had an all-nighter uh, at the Sahara. And it was a uh, basically a topless review. 
but the band that w uh, was was playing behind the topless, the girls who came out, um, they were a group out of San Antonio, and um, they were really, really good, really tight, really solid, and they were called Los Blues or something like that. Had a bass player um, named uh, Louis Ruiz, I believe was his name, and um, they went... They, I remember they hit the down, the girls left and they, they blah, 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 off the stage. And the, the band then took over. And the first song they played was kind of a, a basic blues song. And then um, they went into improvisation. Everybody took a, took a ride, as we say. Piano player took a ride, guitar player took a ride. And it was a cycle of the song. And um, the bass player, Louie, was playing an Ampeg clear lucite bass and he was just going along and laying down the beat and everything and then it came time for his solo and he walked to the front picked up a trumpet and kept playing with his left hand on the bass and played an improvised lead on the trumpet Whoa. and i just absolutely fell out i've never seen it i had wow. never seen anybody do anything like that before mm -hmm. and uh so this whole thing this whole little piece of chronicle here uh, of, about the the bass guitar was uh, was in honor of Louie, who uh, who did something that I thought was totally impossible. Can you imagine playing the bass with the left hand and all that, and then just blowing an improv on his on the trumpet with his right hand, just out the window. It was really it was something. And all this happened on this four o'clock in the morning, sitting at the bar at the. At the Sahara. Four o'clock in the morning. That's yeah. when I get up. <laughs> I get up at five. <laughs> well, I used to get up at two or three, and then I re <laughs> realized I wasn't uh, going to last very long if I kept living that way. Um, uh, so well, I've, actually, you can you can do. I I I got into getting up at five in the morning many many years ago uh, when I started running. I was a runner for oh. twenty years until my body gave out on me. And um, when you run in Mississippi or Alabama, which is where I ran, uh, in the summertime, you've got to do it early. Because it, by the time the sun comes up, it's already 80 or low 80s. And uh, it's, it's pure hell. <laughs> and um, so I got in the habit of getting up at like quarter to five or five o'clock in the morning. And it's just a lovely time of day before the sun comes up. It's not a lot of brains out there, you know, mm -hmm. manipulating reality. And it's just a really lovely... And I've got a little house with a, well, it's a, a house in Tuscaloosa, and I've got a screen porch on the side, and behind us is nothing but woods and and southern jungle, and um, uh, it's like the illusion of privacy, and so it's it's just really a it's really a pleasant you know it's a pleasant time of day. I'm I'm up at five. If, if I'm still up at ten o'clock at night, it's a rare occasion. You know, and this from a guy who used to play until two in the morning and sleep until 11 or 12. Well, I can't wait to get back to being a normal person from the standpoint of uh, get. I want, I want to work to get <laughs> up about 7 or 7.30. That's what I'd love to do. I just can't do it, though. Yeah. Well, I also have cats, and they, they're in the Oh, habit. you got cats, too. Wow. I got four cats. What kind of cats are they? They're just cats. Just, <laughs> just general cats. Yeah, and my daughter, my daughter and my wa my youngest daughter, Erin, and my wife, uh, Becky, um, they named all the cats, and I was I didn't like what they named. They named them all Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got Minerva McGonagall, I got Oliver Wood, I've got Draco Meowfoy, mm. <laughs> and I've got Charlie Weasley. Charlie showed up about a year ago. It was cold one night, and he jumped up on the windowsill and so we let him in yeah thank you for Ooh, letting him in uh, you know <laughs> that was my first mistake oh it was a big <laughs> 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 well well you helped them live a little bit longer i guess well, uh, that you know but i like it i'm here with them I, I don't go out much anymore i'm 80 years old i don't like to drive i just I, I really like my life right now it's just very small and very very it's just very pleasant and i i share the house with with cats my my wife, uh, she she teaches um, Tai Chi and Qigong 
a oh, book wow. here. So she's out a couple of days, and then she's also an audiologist, and she teaches or she uh, works at a part time at a at a local ENT office. And uh, so it's just me and the cats around, and and you know they're really great. It's just uh, they're four of the best friends I've ever had. You know, they're not going to sell me down the river. <laughs> Oh, you don't know about that, you know. <laughs> they could. It all depends how it ends up, yeah, I guess. I mean, that's the end point. Yeah, white oak flax. Do we have time to do that? Sure. Because I sure flats. would. Is that okay? White oak flats is the original name for Gatlinburg. Yes, and this is what I wanted to learn about because I've heard all kinds of crazy things about Gatlinburg. And then reading well, your stuff, uh, I didn't realize uh, what a tough place it was. Well, I go back to I go back to early well to 1965 with Gatlinburg. We did a we did a um, this the group that I was with David Delarosa and Brooks. One of the first things we did was we drove from New York to Gatlinburg to do a, uh, a Southern University Student Government Association conference, and a lot of acts came in and they would do like a 20 minute set, and it was a showcase. And what we were trying to do was block book, which meant we could play um, North Carolina State in Raleigh and then pick up five or six small schools for the next five or six nights through North Carolina, like um, um, Elon College and um, Mitchell College in Statesboro. I think it's in Statesboro. And Lenore Ryan in Lenore Ryan. Um, and just, you know, pick up, make some money. And, and bring a, uh, some good music and good showbiz to, to the smaller colleges. And um, so we did that. And uh, I really got hooked on Gatlinburg at the time. Not Gatlinburg so much, but the mountains, the Smoky Mountains. That was my first my first kind of glom onto that that wilderness there that I had never experienced in my life before. Mm -hmm. It took me some, some time, but by 1970, um, I had pretty much uh, ended my association with New York City. And while my then wife and daughter stayed for another year, I went out on the road from a group that worked summers in Gatlinburg. Oh. And um, so that that was my, my, and then after our summers were over, we were all down there, and that's where we lived. And uh, that that's basically what, what drew me south out of New York. Um, but uh, White Oak Flats, is a, it tells about the first time driving down there to do that initial uh, showcase in 65 and, and go, you know we had interstate going down through Virginia then was sometimes it was finished and sometimes you were back on US 11 two lane mm -hmm. and uh, so it was like every mile was going deeper into what Joseph Conrad's book was about which was the heart of darkness yeah, you know we got into darkness. northern Tennessee and we went back these old country roads and across these rickety old bridges to get to Gatlinburg and, and uh <laughs> Uh, it was just um, it was just a crazy place, and then all of a sudden we were there, and it's a tourist town, you know. And we spent the night, and and um, uh, uh, before our show the next day, and there were a lot of other acts in from New York, the Bitter End Singers. I doubt anybody remembers these people, and um, a group from Atlanta called the Town Criers, which I, a group I worked with over the years when I was in Gatlinburg, and. Um, um, I remember we partied a little heavy the first night we got there, and the next morning I got up and walked out of the hotel out to the main street, and I took a right looking for a place to get a breakfast, and I had a hangover. You know, I, I didn't feel well. <laughs> you know, I had that, that uh. What were you, what were you beer. drinking then? Was it just beer? We, or? Yeah, we were, yeah, that's all you could drink in the South, if you were lucky, and it was a wet county. Actually, the county was dry, but the city, the tourist city was wet. Wow, but I didn't you, know that. But you had to buy it before 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of limitations there. Right? Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. yeah, they got after you pretty good when it came to the moral stuff. Um, but anyway, um, I, I walk, wandered up the street, and I, and I remember in my kind of headache stupor, I remember looking to the left, and I saw this big mountain. I mean, it was just this big wall of green and, and the way, way up there and everything, and that that basically was it, and it took me a while to get there, but I did finally get there, and it was a. It did wind up as being, as the writer John Cabot Zinn calls it perfectly, the mountain. It's a place of wonder and dread, and that's exactly what that part of the country was for me. 
worked the out word, a lot of stuff. It's a great. It was a great. It was a great play. The words, word it sent, itself. The uh, Gatlinburg sounds really like a tough place. Is is that yeah. true? Or was it reflected by that, or am I just like, imagining this? Uh, well, a little bit of everything. Um, there was a man who moved into Gatlinburg in probably before, well, it was before the Civil War, and uh, his name was Radford Gatlin, and he oh. was the postmaster, and he had a general store or something like that, and he had a slave. He had now, a what? He, a slave? A slave, a black woman. A, a slave. Oh, my God. And East Tennessee, Sevier County, which is where Gatlinburg is, all of East Tennessee was very much pro-Union during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of places in the South that were like that. There's a, a county, Winston County in Alabama, that wanted to secede from Alabama during the Civil War. Um, so East Tennessee was very pro-Union, and the people in Gatlinburg had no truck with that slavery. I mean, they, they didn't like it, didn't have any, couldn't imagine it. I mean, they're real... They're like old Scots Irish, and um, um, and so they gave Mr. Gatlin a, an ultimatum: um, you either you get out of this town, or uh, you're not going to like it here. We're going to do something to you. Whoa. And so he said, "All right, I'll leave." He said, "But I'll leave on one condition: you change the name to Gatlinburg." And so they did, and he left. So that's and how he years got later, started. my father called me, and he had been on a business trip to South Carolina, and he said, I met somebody who's, who is a relative of, of the man. Uh, this relative said his, his uh, great-great-grandfather, uh, the city of Gatlinburg, was named after him. And I said, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> you know. What did so he look that's like? how Gatlinburg got its name, from Radford Gatlin. But prior to that, it was called White Oak Flats. White Oak Flats. Yeah. Yes, is the There's original White name. Oak Flats in the it, cemetery in the city. You have to really go looking for it. It's back up behind some tourist traps and things, but it's a, a very old cemetery there. It's a very old area. The, that area was settled about 1800, I think. People came in from southern Virginia and, and western Carolina. Does, uh, I, I don't know, but I feel like I've, I've heard heard something before about Gatling uh, being a pretty tough place, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, uh, it's not It's not that it's a tough place. It's. I like to tell people when I lived there, I learned about capitalism there. Oh. You know, and it's not only a, a, as an economic principle. I mean, it's and, just that everything was ruled by, you know, the dollar. And my my boss is telling me we are out of time. Are you saying that, Cortner? I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio. More to come after this. Our guest is my old and dear friend, Skip Brooks, and you can listen to some of his music and read his writings at skipbrooksprojects.com. Let's return with a question on your website. What do we find there? What do we find there? Well, we find more than we found on those early days when when we were uh, when we were talking on on the ra on the radio. Um, <laughs> when I think I had MySpace or something like that, where I put some of my tunes. But at a certain point, I retired in, from real estate. I was in real estate a long time, and I retired in about five years ago. And that's where you made all your millions. Huh? Is that where you made all your millions? Yeah, that's where I made all my millions, oh, right? Okay, way to go. Yeah. You know, that's the only job I've ever done in the in the so-called American business community, and it was horrible. Oh. It, I did it for a long time, you know, I mean, not to make money, but I just never did like it at all. It was just rough. But anyway, um, what's on the website? Um, I, I realized that after I retired and I wanted to write some more and I wanted to do some more music and things like that. Um, I said, well, I need a, a, we a website. So I created a website, skipbrooksprojects.com. And uh, when you go there, you will see a, a, a main page that tells you you can click on music or books or tall tales, which is what we're talking about tonight, the tall tales. But uh, it's pretty basic. Uh, the music seg the music drop down has my two CDs that I've put together. And you can listen to them and you can buy them. Um, and if you go to uh, 
the drop down of East Lake Studios, you'll see a picture of where I usually work. I'm not there right now because I'm in a, a, a smaller room now. Um, but uh, I've got a full recording setup down there, and I write down there, and um, just kind of pictures of it. And then the third drop down is my books, uh, and they are the first book uh, of the Mountain Trilogy is Hazel Creek, which is a memoir. Uh, and uh, Montese Mountains, which I believe, Bob, you have read. That Certainly, yes. I ever got published. And then my third, the wrap-up, it's a short book. It's called Aiden's Cove, and it's just, after I wrote it, I realized it was a love story, and it was really a nice tie-up, uh, wrap-up to these 99 years in the Great Smoky Mountains, which is what my goal was. I wanted to write, write that time span because it's such a fascinating place to me. I mean, if I was going to move back to anywhere I've, I've lived, I would seriously probably go into Western North Carolina because it's just the most peaceful, beautiful place that I've ever been. But anyway, um, then after that, if you drop down on poetry, if you like poetry, I like to do haiku, and I've got some scribblings there. Um, the media thing uh, is really a plug for you guys. It's where I put my... Um, the times that I, I spend with Bob, I put those uh, those uh, those two hours on this media and stuff drop down. And then, of course, we're on Chronicles and then Contact. That's um, that's probably where your producer was trying to contact me, and I rarely go and check the email there because uh, uh, just this is me. And uh, but anyway, the the it's a it's it's kind of a you know if you want to wander around in an old eighty year old man's head for a couple hours you can go there onto the website skipbrooksprojects.com and um, see what I'm doing and thank you for the plug well what about the Russians are coming can we get into that do you remember in 1965 when the lights went out in on the east coast the big indeed blackout? yes uh, yeah, well, we didn't believe what we were being told about whether it was a blackout or somebody else was doing something. I don't know. But Were you in Baltimore at the time? Yes, sir. I was in New York at the time. I'd just been living there for about five or six months. And um, the group that I had been, I mentioned early in, in this program, David, Delarosa and Brooks, we, when we got to, to New York in January of 65, we basically went into the woodshed, which was... We started creating music, rehearsing, uh, practicing, rehearsing, 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 running up the street to the Parisian to get a sandwich, coming back, rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. And we were on um, the afternoon of the, of the blackout, we were rehearsing. November 9th, 1965, about 5.30 p.m. We were playing and really getting into it, and the lights went out. And we thought, well, what's going on here? So we walked to the, we were on the 15th floor of a apartment building on Jane Street and Hudson, which is the West Village now. This is a long time ago. So we went to the window and looked out, and it was kind of dusk, and there were no lights on. And um, so we just kind of didn't know what was happening. Now, my partner... Um, the late Hod David, a wonderful fellow, um, he started running around the, the, the apartment screaming, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he made sure that the door was locked on the 15th floor of a high rise <laughs> by Jane and Hudson. And I said, Hod, think about this now. The Russians are parachuting into Manhattan. They're coming down, and now they're on the on the ground, and they have located Jane Street and Hudson Street. They've come in. They have walked up 15 flights of stairs because the elevators don't work. They've walked all the way down the hall to this apartment, and they're going to knock on the door, walk in, and kill us all. Yeah, but they, well, they'll do that. And then he said, yeah, that's pretty stupid, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. So we had, um, we had some... Uh, we did the 15 down and 15 back up with some steaks. We had dinner and uh, had a little wine probably, and then we went out. I had a little Volkswagen in those days, and we, we drove out to, to see the scene, and it was just Manhattan in total darkness. 
there were people directing people, civilians just walked out in the middle of the street and started directing traffic. Tony Perkins, you know, the actor, oh, Tony boy, Perkins, yeah. 63rd and Lexington was directing traffic. I mean, it was that kind of thing. Um, and so then we went back to the village and, and we started at the bars, went into, um, the kettle of fish, which was a great bar, uh, down near the gaslight, uh, cafe on McDougal street in the, in the village down ground zero village. And, um, had a couple of uh, had a couple of pops and um, and just kind of wandered around and enjoyed the night. Um, I remember at that at when I was in the and lots of times when I went in the kettle of fish, the little local bar, I'd meet a guy named um, um, oh what was his name? His uh, Peter Torkelson was his name. Peter Torkelson. Yeah, and and I knew Peter from uh, just from you know being around, and uh, he was a great, a good banjo player, guitar player, um, wrote charts. I mean, wrote guitar and banjo charts and things like that. And so he knew what he was doing. And uh, strangely enough, not strangely enough, but fortunately enough, a couple of years later, uh, he wound up being Peter Tork in the Monkees. Oh, yeah. And uh, I don't, I think he, he died about 10 years ago, but uh, I remember him always being a very, uh, uh, very literate, very, um, very interesting fellow. He was uh, just a, 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 one of the denizens of the Kettle of Fish. Kettle of Fish was a great musician's bar in the, in the village. Um, Granite's Village in those days was, a, was an absolute dream to live in. It was before you know, everything turned ugly, and and uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, but uh, the way I thought about this was I had a friend uh, in New York. I'm not going to say his name because he may still be alive, uh -oh. but he was a con man. And he, he literally ran cons. He That was his full-time job. He created identities, started with a library card, and then uh, worked his way up. And he would run scams for a month. Uh, he would take everybody out to dinner, and he would uh, uh, he would spend money from some fictitious identity that was stupid enough to give him a credit card. And he said to me, "This and I remember his I remember his his convert that conversation I had with him, and it's what turned me on to writing this little piece." He said, "I was at Tiffany's, standing right next to one of the circular display racks." And it was just loaded with high-dollar wristwatches, and all of a sudden, all the lights went out. And I knew if I put so much as a finger on one of those watches, the lights would come on, and I'd spend the next two years at Rector's Island. How did you know I, that? <laughs> he didn't know. I mean, he could have grabbed the whole rack and headed out because the lights didn't come back on for another 12 or 14 hours. Oh, hell. I guess that's in a certain sense then unfortunate because he could have had everything he wanted. Well, he could have he could have had uh, well, a bunch well, of money. Yeah, he could have he could have put him in the trunk of his car and driven down uh, downtown and and opened the trunk and say, "Y'all need watches? I got watches." <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Oh boy! Oh, okay. he was a great guy, by the way. He was. Yeah, his name was Dean, and uh, he had a he had a Doberman Pinscher, and the dog's name was Saber, and he was just a sweetheart. Mm. You know, you, you know how you hear about Doberman Pinschers ripping people's throats out and all. Oh, that sure. He was a pussy cat. He was just the nicest dog. And Dean went away for a couple of weeks, and and uh, I took care of Saber. And uh, I remember coming back from someplace one night, parking the car. And uh, getting out of the car, and a guy came out from the darkness of the wall, of the shadows there. And uh, he had a knife, and he was just kind of stumbling along. And I just took the dog on a leash and brought him out of the car. And the guy just looked, and he turned away, and turned and ran away. Good. Um, so Dean right. was really, Dean was a great guy. I think they finally got him in Florida for some federal violation on bad checks. Or something. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but at least. But, you know, he wound up working for um or Allstate or something like that. And I think he probably did real well. <laughs> that happens. That does happen. It does, yeah. <laughs> um, how is Beck's Island? Can you tell us a little bit about this? Beck's Island is, is uh, I started writing it many years ago. I just wrote this kind of 
prologue and a couple of chapters, but I'm, I have two projects going, and Bex is kind of a minor project. It's really hard to write an autobiography, or it's hard to write about your life. At least for me it is. And uh, so that one's kind of stumping me, but um, a lot of these experiences that I've had over the years, I will incorporate into that if, I'm, if I live long enough to write that uh, to write that book to conclusion. I'm also working on another one that um, you might be interested in. In the 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 main reason being that it's it's tangentially about Baltimore. Um, and I call it tech, uh, call. I have a, a working title. It's called Sydney and George. Sydney and, and George. And Sydney and George are are the two sort of protagonists in the book, but it's set in 1916, and it's based on a true event that my that happened to my grandfather, George Washington Ellsworth Brooks. Whoa, what a name! I know. Uh, he was born in 1875. And uh, on the east side of town, in around Patterson Park, and mm. um, lived until a couple of, couple of months before I was born. Um, but in 1916, he worked in the cannery business. He was a, basically a machinist. You know, everything a hundred years ago, they didn't have like computers and all that. They were all machines. You know, the gears and iron and all that kind of stuff. And that's what George was was heavy into, and he's pretty good at it. Uh, uh, he was a supervisor and a and a and a, um, a crew leader for a number of companies, but one company um, sent him to England in 1916 to supervise the installation of canning equipment um, in uh, a little town north of Cambridge, England. And so I, I always found that to be interesting, mainly because it was during the First World War, and it was crossing the Atlantic, and the German U-boats were shooting everything down and sinking everything. And I, you know, always wondered why he, a man of 40 years with children, the youngest being two-year-old twins, my father being one of them, would would put himself at that risk, you know, in mm -hmm. basically, well, it, it happened that the Germans had suspended their raiding in the Atlantic and so it was safe to travel back and forth across. But anyway... My fiction part of this is that I want him to hook up with um, uh, Sidney Riley, the Ace of Spies, and uh, and a and a, a several characters, um, and I want to tie it all to, into. And you got to really be into history to to kind of get this. But there was in the First World War there was a thing called the Zimmerman Letter, which was purportedly a proposal from the German war minister Zimmerman to the Mexican government um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to have Mexico invade the Southwest, get Texas and New Mexico and all that back, mm -hmm. and put enough pressure so that the Germans could defeat the United States in, when they get into the war. So it was among all, or around all of that kind of history, and Sidney Riley, the ace of spies, who may have been a Russian ace of spy, he may have been an English ace of spies and all that. But I'm kind of creating this, this sort of, uh, uh, I don't know what it is. I'm not sure just w where we're going with it, but um, um, is it's this, really uh, turned me on. Is this Sydney? Is this Sydney and George? Sydney and George, yeah. Right, okay. I'm wondering and it sure. started, the whole start of it, 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 the thing that kicked it off was that in, in 1916, early 1916, a German cargo U-boat made the trip into Baltimore in 19, July 1916, was there for a couple of weeks, and they delivered cargo. They, the Germans used cargo subs. They were really big, huge things. Made the trip across. They weren't war machines and everything, but it's just a story of, of if, you, if you Google up that um, the Deutschland submarine in Baltimore, it will tell you this whole story of the captain and and um, and how the people in Baltimore reacted to the this Germans coming in because Baltimore is a German city, 
really. I mean, the main, main immigration came out of sure. Germany and Central Europe. We'll be right back on 21st Century Radio after these messages. You're listening to 21st Century Radio, and I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and we're finishing up on Sydney and George. What else did you want to add to that? Um, not a whole lot. Those are just two book ideas I have going. Um, um, Sydney is probably the stronger of the two as far as getting focus and attention and thinking about because, you know, it's not only the writing, you know, sitting down with a keyboard and writing these ideas out. Uh, it's also thinking about it and living with it and being with the characters and all that sort of thing. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty standard for the way most people write fiction. Um, other than that, um, not much music these days. The arthritis has taken its toll on my hands. Um, I can still do some keyboard stuff, and but I don't, I don't plan on doing any new music. I'm, I'm going to be writing from here on out. When did that begin with the, the well, problem with your hands? Um, a few years ago or a long time yeah, ago? three, four years ago. I mean, I can still play keyboards because that's pushing up, pushing down and mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. But it's the gripping of the, of the neck. There's two things that guitar players should never do. One is not be able to tune their guitar. And the, and the other one is you can't have string buzz. You've got to have strength enough to, to put your fingers down tight enough to make a clear tone on the guitar string. And that's where I'm kind of losing it. I, played, I see. I played 12-string guitar for a long time, and that's a lot of tension. And I wasn't playing just, you know, E, A, B chords. I was doing minor sevens and flat fives and all that sort of thing on a 12-string. So I'm kind of paying the price for for that. But um, um, I've got a lot of stuff in the, in, the, in the library, a lot of tunes in the library. And um, I, I do like to go downstairs and mix them and just kind of fiddle with them and play with them. So maybe there's a third CD in it before uh, before I kick. Um, but so you have, do you have a studio? It, it, and writing is absolutely, writing is, is just incredible. It's just wonderful. So good for you to do, you know. I urge everybody, write. Yeah, write I, I agree with you uh, from that standpoint. But uh, I um, would I'd like to know a little bit more about your involvement with football clubs in Liverpool and things like that. Is that possible? I'm, I'm basically just a fan. Um, I was, uh, I have, my son is now in his middle 30s. And when he was a kid, he started playing soccer with the YMCA here in Tuscaloosa, you know, as a five-year-old and, and uh, moved up through the YMCA leagues and all that and then worked on a, played on a club team until he got to high school and then played high school defensive football or soccer um, for four years at, um, at Central High in, in Tuscaloosa. And through that, I had, because I was in real estate, I had a lot of free time. Um, not a lot of free time, but just kind of irregular free time, you know, so I could schedule going to the coaching, going to the practice in the afternoons. And I wound up kind of helping out the coach and learning a bit about soccer. Um, and Really, as my son got older, he, he kind of packed it up after high school, but he became a Manchester United fan. Um, oh, in my. The Premier League, you know, and they were, uh, Man U was, was flying pretty high then. But because of the Beatles and because of my grandfather sailing into Liverpool in 1916, and I just had a little more sensibility and a little more feeling. Liverpool, Baltimore and Liverpool are very similar. They're industrial towns. Um a uh, lot of neighborhood, a uh, lot of local focus and all that sort of thing. In, in, um, in Baltimore, they're Baltimoreans, and they speak a, a special language. In Liverpool, they're Scousers, and they speak Scouse. They speak a, a local Liverpool language. So I just kind of grew a little more toward Liverpool. And um, so I've been a fan for years. You know, I, I always, you know, and I live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which is, the, you know, the home of the University of Alabama. And, and in college football, they they're really superior. They're yes, they are. That they're all, always up there at the top. Outstanding program. I mean, it's so good for business. Let me tell you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you know, I I have uh, I would literally rather watch a Premier League football match, an English Premier League football match, than watch like Vanderbilt play South Carolina. I mean, 
you know, I really like English football or European football right? or football that they play all over the world other than in the United States, you know. Yeah, it's it's what we call soccer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but it's it's serious stuff and it's very uh, – it is as – it has the intellectual depth and uh, – what's the right word? I mean the, the demand for training that – Football does and NFL does here. Mm -hmm. in this, uh, NCAA football does here in this country. Um, I just kind of like that sport. It's 90 minutes. They never stop except somebody gets hurt. And, um, you know, it takes two and a half hours and you're done. <laughs> and yeah. you can go on with your day. With football in, in, uh, in America, you know, it's an all-day sport. You know, they start early and you end late. <laughs> well, <they're laughs> Win or lose, you know. Um. But, and are and basically their lives are more or less controlled by that day on Sunday when they're going to play, uh, no matter yeah. what. Well, you know, I used to I was involved with the Ole Miss football program when I when I lived in Oxford, Mississippi, in the early '80s, and um, I wound up I was a unit manager uh, in the overnight when. In those days, you went out and you cabled the stadium and you shot a four-camera shoot, uh, and you brought all of that back, and then you created a coaches show overnight on Saturday night. Oh, uh, so it was really arduous, you know, because in those days you didn't have uplinks. You had to. I had to get a tape to Memphis so that they could air it on the uh, Memphis ABC affiliate. Um, by 11.30 on Sunday morning. So we had to put the whole thing. We would go out and shoot the game, then come back and work all night and create the coaches show and get that done. I loved it. It's um, I love shooting football. I loved, I did basketball and did, did football. I was a director in the, in the production truck. And, uh, because, and I, I realized that it's the same reason I love performing is because it's, it's life in the moment. Life in the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you miss the field goal, you're, you're not going to rerun it for you. You know, you got to be there in the moment with all of it. And it's, um, uh, I really enjoyed doing that that football thing. Wound wandered through stadiums, every stadium in the SEC, and you know things from Texas to Notre Dame to everywhere. And it's um, who it's, who gave yeah. you the right to do that, or did, um, don't you need a right? I worked for the University of Mississippi. Oh, that's why, of course. Yeah. You were with the big guys. Well, not so much that. We had a great crew. Most of them were students. You know, we gave we gave students a, a great deal of experience in 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 remote productions. You know, I mean, we had a production truck and the whole deal, and um, it was just really great. I I kind of missed that. I missed that performance thing. Um, I, at at my age, I would never get back on stage again. It's just, I have a thing about old people trying to recoup their glory days, and I'm, you know, that's not just what it's about. Mm -hmm. But for me, um, uh, but um, you know, it's uh, I, I I like live. I like that. I like when it's happening. I like you know, being in the moment like that. So, what is the importance of the Great Smoky Mountains that makes you want to write about them so much? You know, I thought about that a lot over the years. I had this like 55 year fascination with that place. I still do. My, my oldest daughter still lives there. I've got a lot of, a lot of history and a lot of time spent there. Um, but at a deeper level, I think it was the fact that, that I came from cities. Um, I'm a city boy. I grew up in Cockeysville, but we were city people, you know, we're born in Baltimore and we, generations and lived in city people and just to to be a part of just tangentially live on the edge of that absolute wilderness it just it did something to me it took me over it took me out of i don't know that 50s 60s mentality mm -hmm. put me into a place where i was a little more able to deal with my own self i guess that's what it is Groove Merchant, what does tell us about this? Uh, uh, Groove Merchant was a band I worked with. I remarried in in seventy seven, and in nineteen seventy eight, my my new wife uh, 
uh, uh, finished a master's program in audiology at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I was living in Gatlinburg at the time. And she had two choices. She had two job offers. One was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is a great city. Uh, but I probably would have wound up, you know, unloading ships. <laughs> oh, boy. And the other was from the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi. So she took that job, and we moved and started our new life there. And it was, um, it was, it was, um, it was just, a, it was really wonderful. And um, uh, I worked first as a assistant manager of a, of a restaurant which I'll never do again. <laughs> and uh, it was awful. Why and, was it uh, awful? But, oh, I just, it, food service is just, I just don't like it. You know, mm -hmm. I'd rather sell t-shirts, you know. Um, but anyway, um, we booked a band into that restaurant one weekend night, Friday or Saturday night. And uh, they were jazz players from the Ole Miss jazz band. And their keyboard player didn't show up the first night. And they started playing, and I knew they were pretty damn good. And so I asked the bass player if I could sit in. And he said, sure, Pops, go ahead. Yeah, and, Pops. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, I was older than the drummer's father <laughs> at that time. <laughs> Went back to school in my mid-30s. And uh -huh. um, uh, we played some fusion jazz, and I was right there with them, and they were like, Okay, <laughs> so we formed a little uh, a fusion jazz band. They were wonderful players, absolutely just top of the line killer players, and um, played around around Oxford for a year or two. But we when we came up with a name, we said uh, we can't be Lenny and the C notes anymore. So what is their name going to be? So the bass player decided we were going to be Groove Merchant. So uh, that's what the Groove Merchant thing is. Was this uh, the same Oxford town that uh, the Dylan, same one. <laughs> Dylan was talking about? Knows. Oxford town, Oxford town, everybody got their head down now. Yeah, but I got to Oxford in 1978, and uh, it it had changed a, a good bit. I see. And, you know, if you've ever lived in, I don't know if you, you probably haven't, but if you live in a, a, a college town, there is a at least a... a a small minority core of intelligent people. And um, it's large enough now in Tuscaloosa to have changed. The university changed Tuscaloosa from being a small southern town to, you know, like a, a more reasonable place to live and, and function. It's, Tuscaloosa is not a little tank southern town. It's just not do that. It's, it's just not like that. So it's a pretty good place to live. Well, then tell us a little bit more about the shed, which you notice is more Gatlinburg, where you played in the summers of 73 and 74. Was this the legendary hangout, the shed? Yeah. It was. Okay. It was. Yeah. There You're right, Mar. If, if, if I ever write the story of Gatlinburg, the shed will have at least one chapter of its own. It was a scandalous place, and it was wonderful. It was just because you had tourists, you had locals, you had the whole thing. Um, it was a bar that served uh, the only food it served was a uh, corned beef sandwich, mm -hmm. and everything else was beer. They had a front bar and a back bar, and I performed in the back bar. They had a couple of porches over one of the rivers that ran through Gatlinburg. I mean, it was really, really nice and real funky. You know, it was funky and nice at the same time. Oh. Real, real laid back. I mean, people like, I remember um, Allman, um, Greg Allman had a, had a, had some land down in Pigeon Forge and he would come up and, um, and uh, every now and then grace the, the Gatlinburg with his presence. And he came into the shed one night and nobody noticed him. <laughs> it was just, it was sad watching. You know, I was on stage when he came in, and nobody turned around. Nobody said, hey, man, hey, are you, you know, anything like that. It was that kind of place. Everybody was a star. Oh, but it was a, a huge ego town. Everybody was a star. Was he ever offended? Any of these people offended that they didn't get yeah. enough what they wanted? Yeah. Doubt it. No. Okay. Uh, we had, you know, lots of people would come through. We had, um, 
you remember the New Lost City Ramblers? Yes, I remember them. They came through one night, and uh, they were doing some field work, looking for tunes in Western Carolina. They came over into Gatlinburg. They came into the shed one night, and I was doing a set. We got to hanging out and everything. They were great guys from New York, I think. They were from, uh, I can't remember their names offhand, because I'm old. <laughs> yeah, that but, always uh, is a problem it was, when you get old. It was world class. It was just the greatest place in the world. I worked there for a year, a summer or two summers, I think. It was just me. I'd play guitar a little bit, and I'd play piano and sing, and, and do that. It was just wonderful. You know, you had, you could control a small house, and um, that's what every showbiz guy wants to do. I mean, I want to be in charge of the audience. Well, I understand now we are out of time. We are. Right now, after four and a half years here. Now the, so it is time to say goodbye, and I understand that. I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, you, there's no chance of your ever coming up here again, is there? There's always a chance. I mean, you never know. Um, maybe I can get my daughter to, to, to drive me up there. Great idea. That's a great idea. That would be. We should get together. Then we can get together. Yeah. yeah so like just the old, like the old days, and then we'll go out there and sing on the beach. And there you go. But I'll everybody else, it's too cold now out here on the beach, so they're throwing, going to throw us off. <laughs> I'll throw that at Taylor <laughs> Brooks and see what she thinks. I love you, man. Always have. Ditto. Well, let's stay in touch and look forward to getting together in the future. Thank you for joining us on 21st Century Radio, and we'll see you next week. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cortner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.